Simple harmonic motion, that's what we're going to do. So this is the first part of my classical mechanics, classical mechanics series. Uh, and I want to start with a problem that maybe we've looked at before, maybe you've looked at another class and that's fine, but I want to do it the classical mechanics way. So what we're trying to do is to come up with equations of motion for different situations. And this is one of the most common problems to look at in classical mechanics and all of physics because it appears all over the place. So the idea is that if I have a mass connected to uh, a spring, and this spring exerts a force. In this case, let's say that the spring exerts a force that looks like this, negative kx. So if I pull the mass, the more I pull it this way, the greater the backwards pulling force that way. If the mass went over here into the negative x direction side, then the force would be in the positive direction. So the force is always going to pull it back to the origin. If that's the only force acting on it, then I can write Newton's second law as negative kx is the force, and that's mass times acceleration. Now, here's the first thing that we're going to do that maybe is a little bit different. Maybe you haven't seen this before, okay? And that is to write the acceleration in a different way. So normally we would write uh, the velocity in the x direction. We're, this is one dimensional, okay? We're just dealing with one dimensional stuff. As the derivative of x with respect to time. We're going to write time derivatives like this, x dot. So if you have a dot over a variable, that means we're taking the derivative of that with respect to time. It's a shorthand notation, but it looks cool. Okay, It's going to be very useful because we're going to do a lot of derivatives and stuff. And if I take the second derivative, the acceleration is the second derivative of x with respect to time, we're going to write that as x double dot. Okay, so the second derivative is a double dot. If you want to take the third derivative, it'd be a triple dot, but I don't know if you'd do that. Okay, so back up to here, I can rewrite this as negative kx equals mx double dot. I can solve that for x double dot is negative m negative k over mx. And that's my differential equation of motion. And what we want to do is to solve that. Now, there are lots of ways to solve differential equations. The best way is to guess. So let me write that over here on the side because I'm going to erase that stuff. Uh, x double dot negative k over m x. And what we want to do is just to guess a solution. So let's guess. We, we're looking at this, right? What do I, what function of x, if I take the derivative twice, I get the same thing back with a negative constant. And there are multiple solutions here, but the one that's most common is trig functions, sine and cosine. Both of those, if you take the derivative twice, you get the same thing back. So let's say x, and this is a guess. I'm going to put up here guess, because it's important to realize that's a guess. A cosine omega t plus b sine omega t. So you have to have omega in there, right? Because remember, cosine is a ratio of sides of a triangle. And if I have just time, then there's no way time can be a ratio. If I multiply that by a constant uh, that has units of radians per second times seconds, I get radians and it will work. So you have to have that in there. Um, and then we have to have it in there another way too. So let's go ahead and check this equation, see if that's true uh, by taking the derivative. X dot as a function of t. The derivative of cosine is negative sine, but I have to use the chain rule and take the derivative of the stuff inside. So I get negative a omega sine omega t. And then I need to do the same thing over here. The derivative of sine is cosine multiplied by the derivative of the inside. So I get plus b omega sine omega t. Let's take the second derivative. It's just the derivative of the derivative. And now here I get negative a. The derivative of sine is cosine. So I have another omega in there, omega squared cosine omega t. And then again, another omega over here. I'm going to get a ne Sorry. Uh, <laughs> I get another negative right here because I'm taking the derivative of cosine b omega squared sine 
omega t. So this is equal to, if I factor out the omega squared, I get negative omega squared x, because x is a cosine omega t plus b sine omega t. So this is true if omega squared is k over m. Okay, so that's important. I'm going to put uh, omega squared is k over m. That has to be true. Okay. But what about a and b? Those are just constants, right? That they never did anything in here, so it doesn't really matter. Well, we can actually find those constants by looking at the initial conditions. So let's say that at x, at time t equals 0, x0 zero is x0. Zero. x of 0 is x0. Zero. If I use that for this function, I put in t equals 0, I get uh, a cosine of, of 0 plus b sine of 0. Well, sine of 0 is 0. And this is 1. So I get a is x0. Cool. OK, now let's say that x dot, the initial velocity, x dot, is v0. Well, now I can just put in t equals 0 up here, and I get negative a, which I already know is x naught, uh, omega sine of 0, which is 0, minus b, no, I'm up here, plus, plus b omega times cosine of 0, which is 1. So b is equal to v0 over omega. Now, remember, omega is the square root of k over m. So this is going to be v0 square root of m over k. Because I'm dividing by that. If I want, I can put those in up here. I'm going to. x0 v0 square root of m over k sine omega t. So there I have my uh, full differential, my full equation of motion for a simple harmonic oscillator. Of course, there's a problem. Number one problem is that, you know, I have this spring where uh, there has no unstretched length. A real spring might look like this. So it has some unstretched length L0. And if I pull it over here, then it would have a mass. It would be, there'd be a spring pushing it back. If I push it over here, then it would be pushing that way. So how could I write this up with a real spring? Now, of course, the, the simplest solution is to say, well, I'll, I'll call that x equals 0. That works. Okay. But it also works if I write the force as negative k x minus L0. So in that case, imagine x is greater than L0, then this term is going to be some positive number that's going to be equal to the stretch, and the negative would push it back this way. If x is less than L0, then I'm compressing the spring, and it's going to push it back this way, because that's a negative. This will be a negative and a negative right there. Okay. So let's write this as Newton's second law. Negative k x minus L0 equals uh, m x double dot. So that's, that's a much more difficult equation to guess a solution for. But we can cheat, right? We can cheat by making a substitution. So suppose I let s equal x minus l0. The derivative of s, s dot, is going to be x dot minus the derivative of l0, which is a constant. And then I can take s double dot. It's just going to be x double dot. So if I make that substitution and I put in uh, s equals x minus l0, that's s. And x double dot is s double dot. So I get negative k s is m s double dot. And we don't need to solve that equation because it's the same mathematically as the previous version, right? So you don't have to. It's the same thing. Now, there's a much more common problem that we see with a mass on a spring, and that's how do I deal with a vertically oscillating spring? So it turns out that 
uh, it's much easier to make a spring oscillate up and down uh, with this way because then you don't have as much friction. If you have a horizontal cart or something with the, with the spring, it's much more difficult. Um, number one, you need a spring that both compresses and stretches. Uh, number two, you have friction. But if you hang a spring, you can get it to work very well. So we're gonna do mass, you do it, and experimentally you do it this way. So we still have a mass on a spring. We still have, a, let's just say this is y equals zero. This is the spring constant k. So I can write Newton's second law as negative ky minus mg equals my double dot. So now I'm dealing with y as a direction. And let's just check, right? So this says that if this moves down here, I'm, I'm setting that equal to y equals zero. If it moves down, uh, then that would be negative. So this would be a positive force. Uh, and then that's always down. Okay. So I'm measuring y in the normal sense. That's positive y. Well, this is not an easy differential equation to solve. I mean, it is if you cheat, right? So let's use the following. Let's find the equilibrium position. So down here, there's going to be some place where it stretches, uh, where y is equal to y0, and the gravitational force is equal to the spring force. So in this case, I can say negative ky0 minus mg equals 0, or negative ky0 equals mg, uh, y0 equals uh, m negative mg over k. I always make a mistake here. So let's call, uh, let's again make a, a variable change. s equals y minus y0. So it'll be the distance from the equilibrium. Uh, if I put that in up here, I get, well, let's take my derivatives first. I can see that s dot is equal to y dot s double dot is equal to y double dot. So that's good, right? So my derivatives are the same. So if I put that in up here for s, so y, what did I say? No, s is y minus y zero. So y would be s plus y zero. If I put that in up here, I have negative k times y s plus y zero, uh, minus mg equals m s double dot, right? We already showed you that the second derivative is the same. I erased it already, but let's put it back. <laughs> Why did I erase it? I had, uh, let's say, negative k y0 minus mg equals 0. That was true for y0. So y0, running out of room right there. So y0 is equal to mg, negative mg over k. So if I put that in right here, I get negative k s uh, plus mg k over k minus mg equals m s double dot. That's a terrible double dot. That cancels and now I get not surprisingly, negative ks equals ms double dot. That is the same differential equation that we had before. Okay, So you need a little trick to, to get that to work uh, algebraically, but it's not that big of a deal. OK, one more solution. Okay, So we want to solve this numerically. So let's go over a numerical solution, and I'm going to show you all the nitty-gritty steps for a numerical solution. Let's go back to our differential equation. Uh, we had mx double dot equals negative kx. Now, in a numerical solution, what we're going to do is to break our motion into short time intervals. So let's say delta t is 0 0.01 seconds. 
Now, during that short time interval, we can make the assumption that x double dot's constant. So I can say x double dot is negative k over m times x. So I can solve for the numerical value for x double dot if I know the value of x, I know the value of k, I know the value of m, which we need to know those values. So let's just pick. Let's say k is equal to 10 newtons per meter. Um, my initial x, x0, is 0 0.01 meters, and the mass is equal to 0 0.1 kilograms. I just pick some values, it doesn't really matter. Okay. So if I know the value of x double dot, what I can do is assume, assume x double dot is constant over that time interval. If that's true, I could say x double dot is equal to delta x dot delta t. So it's a rate of change, it's not a derivative. And I can write this as x2, let's write this as x, let's write this as x2 dot minus x1 dot over delta t. So this says that the final x velocity minus the initial x velocity divided by the time. Now, I can solve this whole thing for x2 dot. x2 dot is x1 dot plus x double dot delta t. And just multiply both sides by delta t, add x1. So this says if I know the initial velocity, I can solve for the, the acceleration, multiply by the time interval, and I can get the velocity at the end of the time interval. Now let's assume that the velocity is constant, which is not. Let's assume that it is. I can say x, which I just solved it, x2 dot is delta x delta t, which is x2 minus x1 over delta t. So x2 is x1 plus x, x2 dot delta t. So this method of solving for the conditions at the end of the time interval uh, work very well if the time interval is small enough. And then I can just do it again for the next time interval, and then the next time interval, and then the next. So I keep repeating these calculations. I always start off, I calculate x double dot, update x dot, update x. I need to update t too. t2 is t1 plus delta t. But then you just keep on doing that over and over and over again for as long as you want. Now, Suppose I want to find out where it is after one second. Well, if I have a time interval of 0 0.01, I need to do this 100 times. Um, and if I want to make, if I want to do it fewer times, if I wanted to say a time interval of 0 0.1, and I'm going to show you that, uh, I'd only have to do it 10 times, but it would be a worse assumption that x double dot's constant. Okay, so you're always in this balance over here. Nobody wants to do a hundred calculations. So we're going to make a computer do it. Okay, so I'm going to go through all the steps of doing this in Python. Now I'm going to go fast, okay, but we're going to do this uh, a bunch of times in the course. So I want to start from scratch and show you everything that we need to know. I'm using WebVPython in Trinket. So this is Trinket, Trinket.io. Uh, I like it just better. It looks better. There's also glowscript.org. They're the same thing. Okay. Uh, you can log in with an account. You don't actually have to log in an account with Trinket. But Trinket does a bunch of stuff. So up here, if I click this, and I'm zoomed in super high, uh, and I go to my account, I can go to new Trinket, and there's a bunch of things here. We're going to use Python, but don't click Python. Okay. Uh, first of all, Python 3, Pygame, R, and so forth. Those you have to have a paid account to save. You can write in those, but you can't save. But down here, we're going to do Web v Python because it has a bunch of tools in there that are great for Python, for physics. Now, the next thing here, it, you can actually write it in blocks or in code. So we're going to click here in the code. Okay, so let's go ahead and, and enter our variables uh, that we have right now. I already said m was 0 0.1, k was 10. Uh, what else did I say? Uh, x0 is 0 0.1. I'm just going to call that x. I, I actually do need the initial velocity too. I, I forgot to show it up here, but in order to find the new velocity, I need to know what the velocity was at the beginning. So let's call that, I'm going to call it x dot, just to be, it's the velocity, it's 0. I need a time of 0, and I need a time step of 0 
That's it. Okay, so let's make a loop in Python. Now, I, I will say that uh, in Python, case matters, right? You can call things basically whatever you want. You can't start with a number. Um, and the best way to learn Python is to play with Python. Okay, so you just got to break stuff, and it's fine. It's fine. Uh, let's go ahead and make a loop. And I'm going to show you a loop while t is less than 1 colon. So in Python, we can make a loop, a while loop, with a condition like t less than 1 and then a colon. Everything below that that's tab indented is part of that loop. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this, print t, and then t equals t plus dt. So that line 12, what it does is it takes my value of time, it adds the dt step to it, and then it makes the new value of time. If you don't have that, Time will always be less than one, and you will have a loop that runs forever. And you don't want that. Okay, so this will print out a hundred times, uh, but let's just run it anyway. There we go. There's all my times. So that's how we make a loop. But we don't want to. We don't want to print out the times. Okay. Instead, what we want to do is to do our calculations. Remember, the number one thing we said was to calculate x double dot. So I'm going to say x d d d dot for double dot. Uh, and that's going to be equal to negative k times uh, x divided by m. That's my differential equation. Negative k x over m. Same thing. Now you notice I don't have x1, I don't have x2, and stuff like that, because I'm changing my value of x. So I don't need to worry about that. Um, now I'm going to update my x velocity. So x dot is x dot, which here is really important. I can't update the velocity if I don't have the velocity. So I have to have an initial value up there, plus x double dot times dt. And then I'm going to update my position. And let's scroll it up. x equals x plus x dot times dt. And let's just, let's just print. Let's just print x is stupid, but I'm going to print. Say print x equals x. And I'll even put the units, meters just to see if it's working. So it seems to be oscillating back and forth. Um, yeah, going positive and negative. I started at x equals 0. What's a better way than printing? And that's to make a graph. Can't really tell for sure that it's working. So instead, let's make a graph. So to make a graph in WebVPython is super easy. I, this first step you don't actually need, but I'm going to add up here a graph called G1. And it's a built-in object type graph, which is part of WebVPython. Don't mess with that first line. Uh, that's important to, to run the code. Now, in the graph object, I can give a title. Let's say, uh, let's just say subharmonic motion. I can give an X title. I got to spell it right. Let's say it's oh, equals X in meters, and that's just a string. I can give a y, no, I want time. And then a y title I want is x. Now, one of the things that I like to add on here is the width, because I have things zoomed in. I'm going to make that 400, the height 200. Now, that does not plot anything. That just makes the axes for your graph. To actual plot something, you need a g curve. I'm going to give it a name F1 for function 1, G curve, and then I like to give it a color, color equals color dot blue, but you can leave it plain and it'll be just a plain black curve. Now down here, to plot a data point on the graph in my loop, I'm going to plot one single data point, F1 dot plot. My horizontal variable is time, my vertical variable is x. Now let's run this thing and see what kind of damage we did. So this is pretty nice, right? Because we see that it does indeed look like a cosine function because we had, we started with an initial uh, velocity of zero, but initial position of x zero, and so that seems pretty pretty legitimate. Let's just double check, right? If well, I'm not going to, but you could check that the period of oscillation is the same as what you get on this data uh, by just mousing over here, the easiest way to do that. Um, what I want to do instead, and it does work, works very well. And that's not even a, a very small time step. Uh, what if I made a time step of 0.1 instead? 
you'll notice that it it's very blocky, but it's still kind. Ooh, actually, that doesn't work. It goes negative. Well, it's still a, a, a function. Okay, it's not a very good one, but it does kind of work. Uh, so let's go back to a better function, a better time interval. There, that's better. Um, one of the things that is important, this is called an Euler, uh, I mean, an Euler method for the numerical calculation. There's better methods for numerical calculations, but this is the easiest, and that's why I like it. Now, one thing I will point out is that in this order, you want to do the highest order derivatives first uh, in this line of calculation. So I'm going to calculate the second derivative, then the first derivative, then the, the value. If you switch those around, you do not get nearly as accurate of a, of a solution. Um, you can do a bunch of things to check. You could plot the energy as a function of time, the total energy, see if that's constant. But we're just trying to introduce you know, basic ideas of numerical calculations, basic ideas of solving differential equations with, uh, for something like a simple harmonic motion. Because we're going to do that some more. And sometimes we can solve the differential equations uh, on, on paper or on the chalkboard. Sometimes we can only do it numerically. Okay, so that's that. Classical mechanics. We're going to get into some cool stuff. Talk to you later.